Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. I am not Alex because Alex couldn't be here today, so you will not be hearing his sweet, dulcet tones giving our introduction. I am Noel, and joining me, as previously always on a different show, Evie. Hi! <laughs> Welcome back, Evie. How are you doing? I'm good. I've got a little bit of a cold, but otherwise I'm good. Ever since we had you on for Memoirs of Invisible Man, have you seen any other John Carpenter stuff? You mean besides this thing that you made me watch? Yes, because we save only the best for you. <laughs> I feel like very loved. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. I'm like, wow, I get the really good movies. Everyone else should be jealous. <laughs> no, I rewatched Halloween for Halloween. The original one? Yeah. Still holding up for you? Oh, yeah. It still makes me happy. And if it ever doesn't hold up, all I have to do is watch the remake and be like, no, this could, this, <laughs> this is fine. This is fine. This is fine. I'm fine with this. So anyways, we have you on for Silent Predators, which is about rattlesnakes, which are in no way silent, so I don't know why it's called Silent Predators. Yeah, and I'm trying like really hard not to make some kind of joke about snakes and or a plane. Oh, I totally pitched this movie as It's Snakes on the Plains. <laughs> we'll get into why in a moment. Just to get into a quick little bit of production history, because there actually is an odd little bit for this movie. Silent Predators began life in the mid-70s as an unpublished novel by Fred Brown and Patricia Aragoni. I don't have any info on Brown, but Aragoni was a journalist at the time and has continued writing articles and columns for decades before starting her own travelogue company in the early 90s. She's written a lot about Arizona and California, so she knows some rattlesnakes. But not on a plane. No. Snakes on a truck? Snakes on a train. Were they on a train in this movie? No, but that was the mockbuster that they did for Asylum. Ooh, snakes on an exercise bike. Ah, God, that was so horrible. <laughs> so yes, the initial screenplay then titled Fangs, which for some reason has kind of become a bit of a legendary fabled thing of people thought that John Carpenter had this vampire movie script. That's been floating around. No, no, that's this. Fangs is John Carpenter writing the snakes movie. <laughs> so the initial screenplay then titled Fangs was written by John Carpenter. As we've mentioned in past episodes, John was an extremely prolific screenwriter from 1975 to 1978, as his directorial career still hadn't quite gotten off the ground. Churning out literally a script a month was a way for him to make some money, own his skill, and start making connections in the industry. And other scripts that he wrote around this time of 75 to 78 were Escape from New York, The Eyes of Laura Mars, Zuma Beach, Better Late Than Never, Bad Moon Rising, Prey, and Blood River. And while several of those were original, many of them were actually for higher assignments that he never really had any creative control over, and such was the case with Fangs. There's no date on the screenplay, but according to an interview John did with Starlog, he wrote it immediately after the shoot wrapped for Assault on Precinct 13, while that film was still in post-production, so this was pretty squarely right in the middle of 1976. At the time of that interview, in 1987, the project had actually resurfaced under the name Diamondback, but remained unproduced at the time, and not even John knew who was involved at that point. So I don't know if there was any, like, director signed on or anything like that. So according to John, the project was originally set up at Universal under production manager Jer Henshaw and was meant to cash in on the Jaws craze because they still hadn't managed to get their own sequel, Jaws 2, off the ground. And at the time, Henshaw was also a production executive on Spies, Harry and Tonto, and The Towering Inferno. Aw, oh, Harry and Tonto. That movie was awful. I've never seen it. I think it was at Art Carney or whatever. He won an Oscar for that. That was the one with the cat. What? Is it a talking cat? No, it's not a talking cat. It's just a cat that hangs out with him. Okay. The screenplay says that it was owned by the Whitman Group under producer William S. Gilmore. After some early work as an assistant director in the 60s, Gilmore became an associate producer, production manager, or production executive on films like Ride to Hangman's Tree, Tick, 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 Flight of the Doves, The Wrath of God, The Sugarland Express, and Jaws. He then spent the rest of his career up until 2010 as a producer or executive producer on the likes of Defiance, Deadly Blessing, Against All Odds, Return of the Living Dead, Part 2, 
Midnight Run, The Player, A Few Good Men, The Sandlot, and Steven Seagal's Fire Down Below. Well, so there's at least one classic in there. <laughs> hey, I like Sandlot. That's what I was talking about. So on the finished film, Gilmore is credited as a co-writer of the screenplay as well as co-executive producer, the latter alongside his old company partner, H. Daniel Whitman. The final writer on the script is Matt Dorff, who had a whole caboodle of TV movie credits throughout the 90s and 2000s, including Assignment Berlin, The Stepsister, Growing Up Brady, Inside the Osmonds, Lies My Mother Told Me, Category 6 Day of Destruction, A Christmas Wedding, and The Party Never Stops Diary of a Binge Drinker. I, I got I got nothing. I got TV movies nothing. have such fun titles, don't they? Yeah, no kidding. I was just like, damn. They're either super generic or just wild. Yeah. So the film has a whopping 10 people credited as producers, co-producers, and executive producers, and I'll be damned if I'm going to list every single one of them. You're like, there's too many. I will say the finished film was made by the production company Von Zernick Surter Films, owned by executive producer Frank Von Zernick, who's been churning out TV movies since the 80s. And the two main on-set producers were TV movie veterans Randy Sutter, who most recently did the first two seasons of Under the Dome, and Richard D. Arendo, who produced Pisa My Heart. <gasps> oh my god, that like <laughs> Romeo and Juliet with like pizza places? Um, oh my god. Yes. Oh, that was awful. And the director is named Noel. I saw that. I saw that and I just like had a, like a little bit of a laugh. I was just like, oh, Noel. Noel Nosek, to be specific. After writing a single episode of Adam-12, Noel began directing 70s exploitation fare like Best Friends, Las Vegas Lady, and Youngblood. And after doing the bowling drama Dreamer and the Harry Hamlin racing flick King of the Mountain, he settled into TV movies like Full Exposure the Sex Tape Scandal, Born Too Soon, Without a Kiss Goodbye, Who Killed My Daughter, What Kind of Mother Are You, A Mother's Justice, Another Woman's Husband, Tornado, and the remake of Roman Holiday starring Catherine Oxenberg and Tom Conti. I did not know they did a remake of Roman Holiday, and I need to watch that. And I think Ed Begley Jr. in the Eddie Albert role. God damn it, Ed Bagley Jr. I can make better life choices, dude. And Noel seems to have ended his career in the early 2000s with a few episodes of Hunter and Charmed. Ah, Charmed. And the finished film aired on TBS on June 13th, 1999, three days after the same network debuted the sitcom The Chimp Channel, the first all-simian television series since 1972's Lancelot Link Secret Chimp. I know what you just said was English, but I'm like, no. No, it wasn't. <laughs> None of that made sense. I know. No. Just no, Noel. No. It did not happen. Yes, it did. I feel like I'm staring into the void. That's what's going to happen. See, I remember when that happened because TBS used to just have like these little commercial interstitials involving chimps working around the office. And they were like, hey, what if we actually make a sitcom out of this? And it lasted 13 episodes. Okay, I'm going to... Uh... <laughs> I'm going to go walk into the ocean and just, like, I, I can't. Just let it overwhelm you, yeah. It's, like, washing over me, and I'm just like, I can't. Like, I can't. Yep. All right, let me just jump into the synopsis here real quick, because I don't think we need to read any more TV movie credit titles. No, we don't. Although we could do an entire podcast where we just read those. I know. And trust me, some of these guys have so many credits. I only scratched the surface. Oh, God. So big changes are happening at the small town of San Vicente, California. Industrial developer Max Farrington is in the second phase of his project to develop a new set of suburban neighborhoods, having just moved families into the houses of Phase 1, even as he's begun dynamiting the nearby mountains and fields for the next wave. Little does he know that a rare tropical rattlesnake was set loose on these lands 20 years ago when the truck delivering it to a zoo was overturned, and it bred into the local population, creating a rare hybrid rattlesnake that's bigger and more aggressive than normal, and has a venom which is rapidly more fatal than anything they've dealt with in this region, and that the constant blasts have opened up the underground dens housing tens of thousands of these snakes. The new fire chief, Vic Rondelli, because that's a name, is quick to put together the pieces of what's going on as more and more fatal attacks occur around town. But even his blooming romance with Max's assistant Mandy Stratford isn't enough to sway the rich developer, as he keeps trying to cover his own ass and move his project forward. When the obstinate mayor almost loses his own son to a rattler, that changes the tide as development is shut down and searches and exterminations become widespread. But when Max is the one to discover the den in an old abandoned mine, he wants to play the hero by blowing it sky high himself. 
This results in him dying and Mandy getting trapped amidst the slithering rattlers. But she's saved by Vic, and they kiss outside the entrance as fuel is pumped in and all the snakes go up in a blazing inferno. So Evie, do you recommend Silent Predators? I don't want to say anything mean, but no, it's not good. It's just, it's not. Like, it, it, no, no, no. <laughs> I think this movie broke me a little bit. <laughs> I will say it had better editing than Suicide Squad, though. <laughs> there you go. I also don't recommend it. It's a cheap, flat TV movie. I don't think there's anything particularly egregious about it. I don't think it, there's anything particularly terrible about it. It's just a flat, cheap TV movie. It's not something you can really get soaked into. It's not really something that's going to invest your time. It's just a cheap, flat TV movie. So, thank you for joining me today. <laughs> yeah, done! <laughs> so... One of the things that I found interesting is that you would typically start a movie with the monster escaping and then the entire monster would be about that one snake that got off the truck. Mm -hmm. I kind of like the idea that, no, that one snake that got off the truck then just slithered away and cut to 20 years later after it's bred this whole population that suddenly overwhelms a town. I like that idea. It subverts the expectations of what you would have the movie be. And one other thing that I do like is... I mean, I'm not saying the film does things in a realistic way, but it at least feels realistic in that the snakes are not like gigantic asylum movie snakes. Mm -hmm. There's only a, really a couple of rubber snake effects. Most of it is using real snakes. And it's mostly just that instead of being four feet long, they're seven feet long, you know? So it's not like they're exaggerating things to a degree that strains plausibility. So I give them that. <laughs> yes, we will give them that because we're not going to give them much. Also, that's something they can achieve on a budget. Mm hmm I do like that the snakes kind of seem organized. I mean, like, it's completely unrealistic, but I still love it that the snakes are just like, no, fuck that guy. The snakes are kind of treated almost like insects here. Whereas, you know, they have the colony and they send out scouts and the scouts come back to the colony. I don't know if that's how snakes actually work. I don't think so, but maybe. Well, I mean, I think it's probably different where you have sporadic snakes in like a desert region or places where they're more gathered in the community. I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, I do like that there are situations where it's not just a snake. It's just you walk out 10 feet into a field and suddenly you're surrounded by like 10 or 20 snakes. Mm -hmm. I kind of like moments like that where it's like, oh, we found a snake and there's one next to it and one next to it. And there's another one behind me. Though, I, again, I still don't get why it's called Silent Predators when so much of the story involves them rattling and hearing the rattle. Yeah, like they make a lot of noise for someone who's supposed to be so silent. I mean, I don't think Fangs would have been a particularly fantastic title for this either. A little bit more accurate, though. Yeah, maybe Diamondback. Death Rattle just sounds silly. So, there were characters in this movie. Let's talk about some of the characters. <laughs> there were characters? Well, there was Harry Hamlin. That's true. I don't know if you noticed or not, but the truck driver at the beginning of the movie was Dominic Purcell. Uh-huh. I had to rewind. I was just like, what is that? Oh my god, it is! Yeah, Dominic Purcell, before he got the big shaved head look. Mm-hmm. Because I think this was just a couple years before John Doe. I think probably, yeah. Because I know that's where I first saw him. I first saw him in Prison Break. But anyways, Harry Hamlin. I thought that Logan's dad was very charming. Yeah. One of the main problems that I always have with Harry Hamlin is that he always looked perpetually confused. Yeah. He's like, what the? F what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and his whole story is straight out of Jaws. You know, it's the new fire chief being brought into the community, learning about the neighbors and the surroundings. And he's the only one who, like, takes seriously this threat of snakes. It's Chief Brody. Yeah. Except without it being a shark. Or being married or having kids or anything that personally connects him to any of the victims. Yes, but he has a tragic backstory. <laughs> he slept with his boss's wife and his boss screwed him over. Yeah. It's so tragic, you guys. You won't even believe. And then our other lead is Shannon Sturges as Mandy Stratford. She was also there. Yes. She's pretty. That's like the nicest <laughs> thing I can say. I'm like, she's very pretty and she was also there. I kind of like the bit involving the boots. That was cute. And then had the nice payoff where she actually gets bit by a snake but doesn't go through the boots. Mm -hmm. What do I say about that? I mean, the characters, the developer wants to develop. The sheriff wants to save everyone. She's torn between the two. Technically not the sheriff, the fire chief. Which I'm like, would the fire chief have anything to do with that even? Well, you know, I like that that comes up that it's not really his jurisdiction. And they do hit him with that. But then they kind of forget it, too, by the end. And then the mayor doesn't take anything seriously until his kid almost dies. I mean, it's, it is Jaws. It's Jaws. Oh, yeah. It's Jaws without the really awesome shark. And I will say, I did read the screenplay that John Carpenter wrote in 1976. 80% mm -hmm. of what he wrote 
is still here. It's still this movie. Oh my god. Most of these scenes are still the scenes that John Carpenter wrote. And to be fair, it's not a great script, and it was just a quick for hire work. He only did the one draft, so it wasn't something that he was deeply invested in either. So it's not some of his best work. The main changes from the John Carpenter script are, in the opening scene, he didn't have a hitchhiker, he just had the truck driver. Some, like, deer or something ran out in front of his truck. Instead of teenagers running off at the picnic to fuck, it's an eight-year-old boy. Not to fuck, because he wants a stick. And then it's Mandy is the one who's first coming to town. So those first scenes in town are actually from her point of view as she's going around meeting people. Oh, okay. And the fire chief is already there. And I'm not quite sure why they changed that perspective. Because once you get to the town picnic, everything else is pretty much as it was in the script. It's just those first few scenes are instead of her going around meeting everyone, it's new scenes of the other guy going around meeting everyone. It's probably because it was Harry Hamlin and they were just like, well, I mean, why would you hide such a star like that? And then in the climax, instead of being underground in the mines, it's this big open pit that they find that has all the snakes in it. Mm -hmm. Part of the pit gives way, and that's when Max falls in and gets killed. But it still involves Mandy trapped in the truck with the snakes all around and them trying to get the truck out. So it still plays out exactly the same as it does here. And then two things that they cut. The whole thing where Max goes to the town council and is trying to discredit Vic with the whole backstory mm -hmm. of, you know, he had all this stuff from the boss that his wife he slept with and all that stuff. That wasn't in the script. What it was is Max tries to take control of the situation by trying to make himself the hero. So first, he actually hires this gristle old Quint style snake hunter. Go on. Who, in a nice little subversion of that twist, only lasts 10 minutes before he gets killed by snakes and can't use the anti-venom because he's built up such an immunity to it from having to use it too much. Ooh. So it's like he brings in this expert snake hunter who gets bit by a snake and dies. <laughs> and then Max hires the Hell's Angels. What? He brings in this whole biker gang. What are they going to do? Punch the snakes out? Like, Well, part of it is because they wear the leather pants and the boots, they can't really be bitten their legs so they can walk among the snakes pretty well. So it's like they go around to the snake infested woods or just starting to throw Molotov cocktails around. Oh, that sounds safe. And then the cliff gives way and they fall into the pit. Otherwise, again, like 80% of this, I've heard people say that this was just loosely based on a Carpenter script or, you know, they threw out and rewrote most Carpenter. No, 80% of this script is identical, word for word, lines of dialogue to what Carpenter wrote. This is his script for the most part. It's, um... Yep. Yep. So Fangs is not some lost John Carpenter masterpiece that this tarnished. This is what the Carpenter one was. Even down to his script described, and the snakes have red point of view shots. I did love that, like the POV shot, like red. And most of the kill scenes are what he wrote. Like, again, it was an eight-year-old boy who wanders away from the picnic who gets killed by the snakes, not the teenagers. But the whole scene where it's the girl and her dog encounter the snake coming out from under the house. Mm -hmm. And you think the snake is going to kill one of them, but then the dog just kills the snake. That comes from Carpenter. The woman just getting out of her car in her garage and getting attacked by the snakes, that's from the Carpenter one. I'm trying to think, there was a different one. He didn't have the exercise bike scene. I can't remember what he had in place of it. I do like that the exercise bike scene lets us know that, yes, there are people in this town who are black and they don't have any speaking roles. Well, there's the fire chief, the previous fire chief. That's true. So there's two. One of them was not allowed to speak. <laughs> And then straight from the Carpenter script is also the scene where the mayor's at the ball game and you think he's saying goodbye to his oldest son for the last time that the older son's going to die. But then it was just the rubber snake thrown out on the field by the opposing team. And then lo and behold, the younger son falls through the bleachers and there's snakes under the bleachers. Oh, my God. So, I mean, that's all. Carpenter wrote that. That's all stuff that Carpenter wrote. Grant, I don't know how much of that comes from the original novel because the novel's never been published. They just sold the film option on the novel and the novel never came out. So I don't know how much of this was Carpenter created it, how much of it he just adapted it from the novel. I don't know. But most of what he wrote in that script, we are seeing on screen. So Carpenter fans, this is not like Black Moon Rising where they threw out most of his script. No, most of this is what John Carpenter wrote. Why is he mad at us, Noel? Why did he write this? It's so bad. It was cheap for higher work before he made a name for himself in the industry. You've never seen Zuma Beach or Better Late Than Never, which were some early TV movies that he wrote for hire, too. It was work. It was work. He needed the money. It was so bad. Again, Assault on Precinct 13 hadn't come out yet. Halloween was still a few years away. So what did you think of Patty McCormick? You know, the old actress from The Bad Seed? Yes. Her as Vera, the town councilwoman who loves snakes. Who has the pet shop? 
Which, by the way, dear people in this movie, stop fucking leaving your car windows open. That's why you get snakes in your cars. <laughs> Stupid white people. Hate you. Anyway, I did like that the hero of the movie was actually that little snake that she had. Her pecking snake, yeah. Yeah, you had the, like, rattle that crawled into her car, and then her snake saved her. And I'm like, aww. I like that scene. That is a bit where they did change what Carpenter wrote. I think actually for the right, in her thing, they do that whole setup. If you think she's going to get in the car and die, she gets in the car, starts it, drives and looks over and there's the rattler in the seat next to her. And the big twist is she actually just reaches out and grabs the rattler behind the head and just tosses it into a field. And she just dusts her hands off and walks away because <laughs> she's so used to handling snakes. Yeah, no, I like the other one better then. Yeah, I like that they then made a little character out of it. Because in the script, she does have that scene where she brings out the king snake during the town council meeting. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, why don't we just use these? And I like that they then paid that off, where she just has her pet king snake who saves her life. Although probably not a good idea to be letting your pet king snake crawl around your car, but you do you. It is if it's at a time where you know other people are dying just by getting in and out of their cars. It's kind of like why I let some centipedes run around my apartment. They take care of spiders. So do I. I just stomp on spiders. Yeah, but I'm not always looking for the spiders. The centipedes are. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> they eat them. Meanwhile, everything that's creepy crawly just makes me scream. So, I mean, I like that. I thought it was a good part for her. I thought it was fun. Are there any things that you do enjoy about this movie that maybe kind of leapt out at you? Harry Hamlin is still charming, despite the fact that this movie kind of sucks. He's charming. I'll be honest, though, he had those things where it's like, well, you know, women see things bigger than, you know, snakes and monsters. Yeah. I got that when I was reading a script written from 1975. Yeah. But in 1999, it's yeah. like, even then, like, yeah, you may have wanted to change that line. And to be fair, in 1975, she was still rolling her eyes at him. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I don't know what this says about me as a person, but when it's the girl and the dog out front of the house, I'm like, oh, no, Snake, go for the girl. Go for the girl. <laughs> but I'm happy that neither one of them died, but I was rooting for the snake to bite her. Not the dog, because I like the dog. No, and I even like that twist where the dog just suddenly kills the snake, because again, it's not like some super invincible giant snake that's running around. Mm -hmm. It's just that there's so many of them. And they're not even like slaughtering like people by the tens and twenties. It's just like a couple of people die each day, which is still too much. But yeah, it's, I like that there's that kind of more realism to it. So I do kind of wonder about these people who are just like, the company's like, oh yeah, we're going to fumigate your house. I'm like, if someone was like, oh yeah, we're going to fumigate your house, I'd be like, why? Like, ask questions, people. Be curious about what's going on with your home. Yeah. It's just a precautionary against what? What did you find? Where is it? Yeah. No, everyone's just like, oh, okay. I'm like, just, uh, you all deserve to die by snake bite. Yeah. What did you think of Jack Scalia as Max? All I could think of was actually Tequila and Benetti, because <laughs> I was been watching the episodes that Cinema Snob has. Is he in that? I think he was Benetti. I know that's the one with the person who becomes a bulldog. No, no. It's just a talking dog. A talking dog? Well, a talking dog that apparently no one else can hear, maybe? We're unclear. So what did you think of the character? It kind of bugged me that I didn't get to see him die, but <laughs> that was so cheap, too. I'm like, wait, did he live? What? Is he going to become one of the snakes now? In the Carpenter script, it's like he's literally thrown into an entire pit of snakes. I don't think they could have afforded that. Yeah, whereas this one, it's like something just slithers up next to him, and then it's like, then nothing. And commercial break. Yeah. What I like is that there is at least a little more nuance to his character of it's not just constantly ignoring the problems. He's trying to problem solve. He's trying to problem solve. What I like is that he's always accepting that there's a problem. He just doesn't always make the right choices in terms of how to resolve the problem. He's always trying to resolve it in his best interest, even as he's trying to resolve it. But he still allows himself to make the wrong choices. I like that. He's not purely evil. He's just making stupid decisions. <laughs> he tried. It just didn't end well, but he tried. A large part of it is because he does have a ton invested into this housing development project, and he would lose a lot if he lost that. And he's not wrong when he says, and then all these people would lose their jobs. All this funding <laughs> would go away. He's trying to figure out how to resolve all situations. And he's not focusing on the here and now because he's thinking too much about the broader picture. Yeah, for him, it's sort of like focusing on that as opposed to being like, yes, but also snakes are biting people and they're dying. Yeah, and he's accepting that. I like that the whole situation with Mandy in the climax isn't because he went crazy and took her hostage and dragged her away anywhere. He's like, can you just pull up so you can shine the brights in here so we can place the dynamite and kill the snakes? It's just, it's a bad decision, but it's an understandable decision, I should say. I'm like, you know, make better choices, but like, I also understand the choices that he made. I'm so glad they never like tried to make it a romantic triangle with him and Mandy and Vic. Him and Mandy are just co-workers. He's her boss. So 
I don't know why they put in the whole, like, Vic and Mandy love story. It was just sort of like, oh, let me just grab a shoehorn and uh, wedge that in there. And that was what was interesting about the Carpenter script, because the story started from her point of view and was primarily her point of view. Mm -hmm. It's her story that he's the love interest in. So it was kind of a nice little subversion of the formula. But by making it him, then yeah, it's just a kind of token romance. And to be fair, in the Carpenter script, they like sleep together halfway through. In this one, they don't kiss until the end. Yeah, I was expecting them to sleep together and they don't. I was just like, I mean, okay, fine. Yeah, it's interesting that they then save their first kiss for when they're kissing in front of the inferno that is the ignited mine shaft. Yeah, what the hell was up with that? It's fine, I guess. And then I'm trying to remember, if you just give me a second here to pop open the script, I'm trying to remember if his original script had like a final tag or anything like that, or if he ended it the same way. Yeah, I was almost expecting it to have some kind of ending. That it didn't have that is a little surprise. I think because we're used to it now that every terrible movie seems to have some sort of like, and then they might be back. Okay, in his, they don't kiss. It's just everyone taking in the fire and it's literally everything is on fire. It is truly, underlined caps lock, Dante's Inferno. Roll credits over, fade out the end. So then there's no snake that like slithers out. No. To be fair, it's perfectly realistic that no, they are not killing all the snakes. There's probably still some snakes out there, but at least they know Mm -hmm. what to watch for. And again, I love that it is, if you know that this is a predator that lives in your population, it is not a predator that you can't still manage. That's true. Just get some king snakes and you'll be set. It is like the people who live in those areas of Arizona where you got scorpions and rattlesnakes. You just kind of get used to it and you learn how to deal with it. I think what was just surprising here is that this population built for such a long period of time that it had such an overwhelming amount of numbers that just suddenly came pouring out. Mm-hmm. You know, Once you shave off the bulk of those numbers, it's manageable. To be fair, though, that's a double-edged sword because on the one side, it kind of gives the story more realism. And on the other side, it's still not that interesting because it's almost mundane. (laughs) Yeah, it's like you almost want like a mecha snake that comes out and it's like, you killed my children. Even the John Carpenter draft, as I'm reading it, I'm like, this all makes sense, but it's just so mundane. Even the whole bit where, you know, she's in the car that's trapped in the mine shaft and they have to dig her out. Mm -hmm. Harry Hamlin has to don his full fire gear so he won't get bitten by the snakes. I kind of like some of those bits where he's like walking through the snakes and they're just biting him one after another, but they aren't breaking through the rubber. What was that stuff that he had that he was supposed to like spray on the snakes to make him go away? And he barely used it. Yeah, they got more into that in the script. It was a liquid. It wasn't, I can't remember if it was liquid nitrogen or if it's one of those fire extinguishers that freezes things. And it was just Mm -hmm. by lowering their body temperature, they'll stop attacking. They'll just hibernate. Mm -hmm. In the script, he's like spraying all over the place. He goes around the car and sprays everything. And it's him trying to get her out before they thaw out because he runs out. And the other thing is because it's in an open pit, he's hanging down from a helicopter. And they're trying to use a helicopter to get her out, but they can't. And there's a whole situation as to why they can't. And so he does end up having to just pick her up and run. It's not like they changed much. They just didn't have that kind of budget that they're like, no, we'll hang him off a helicopter to be fine. Yeah, and we'll just have him spritz some things without explaining why. Yeah. I do like how much they actually used real snakes and the look of the snakes. Or anything. There's only a couple of animatronic snakes that I saw. I will say that I now hate snakes, so thanks for this movie. <laughs> So gross. I did also like, as boring as he was, I liked the snake scientist, and I love that he actually came to town and then became really involved in the story. I love the snake scientist. He's the best. And he feels like a real scientist. He's like a guy Mm -hmm. who you would typically go and have one scene where he explains everything, but no, then he comes to town and he keeps being involved. He's out there on the hunt. They could have made the movie about him. I would have liked (laughs) that movie. I mean, it would have still sucked, but at least I liked him. He looked like a dad, you know? He's, He's like, my dad, the snake hunter. That would have been awesome. Oh! Holy shit. What? He's in the Hunger Games movie as Katniss's dad. I don't remember him. I mean, you just get those brief flashbacks to him in the coal mine. Oh, okay. But wow. Yeah, I did not watch the... I watched the first one. He actually doesn't have that many credits. He only has like 18 Mm -hmm. credits, sporadic. And he just pops up every now and then. So wow, that's actually a pretty good get for him for the Hunger Games. (laughs) Oh, okay. He's a writer and a journalist too, so... Oh, okay. So that's probably why... He's been working on that more so than the... He has a day job. Yeah. (laughs) I'm trying to think if there's anything else to bring up. It's a movie that is such a wealth of layers and incidents. It's like there's this whole thing and it's like, there's nothing. Oh, David Spielberg as the mayor. Is he related to the Spielberg that I'm thinking of? Not in any way. Uh, Okay. He had a very adorable little old man punch. I thought that was cute. It was kind of fun seeing him again because he was in Christine as Mm -hmm. like an angry teacher for a scene. 
He actually just passed away here in the last year, but not a bad actor. I thought he did a pretty good job in the role. Again, there's no one in this movie that I think was horrible. No, like there wasn't anybody that was just like awful. I mean, the story's not horrible. The direction isn't horrible. The cinematography and editing aren't horrible. They're all perfectly serviceable, but it's just, it's a cheap TV movie. That's the thing is it's like, that's the nicest thing you can say about it is it's all serviceable. But I'm like, there's nothing spectacular about it. The composer did the scores for every single Land Before Time sequel, starting with part two. I only saw the first one, but good for him. I just don't really have anything else to say about it. I mean, it was interesting because, again, it's a film that has some level of lore to it because John Carpenter, it was this script titled Fangs. You say Fangs by John Carpenter and it instantly makes you curious. What is it? Is it like an early draft of vampires? What is it? To find out that it's, oh, it's just this. Yeah, no, it's just snakes. They crawl around. Yeah. That's it. It's just this snake movie. And that the movie, again, did not really change much of what Carpenter wrote. What he wrote is this movie. Sorry to let you down, John Carpenter fans who think that they diluted a lost masterpiece. They didn't. He wrote this. And this is what he wrote. But the snakes have red vision, so you can at least be happy about that, I guess. I don't know. I mean, at least, like, the hitchhiker wanted to help the driver instead of just being mm -hmm. like, fuck this. Bye. Everyone was surprisingly nice in this movie. Even the bad guy was still thinking of others, even as he was thinking of himself. Yeah. Maybe that's why it's just serviceable as opposed to something else. If you had someone who was at least an asshole, who was just like, I'm out for me and fuck y'all. That's at least something. I mean, one of the things that I did find interesting about reading this, because this happens so early in John's career that there are actually elements of it that he recycled in later movies. Mm -hmm. There's quite a few elements of the romance that very much played into the romance as in two movies, in both The Fog, you had the Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis character, and then you had Someone's Watching Me, where again, it was the woman's point of view and the guy was just her love interest. The young boy who wandered off at the picnic, who was named Tommy was basically the little boy Tommy from Halloween. And then in the Carpenter script, there was the town councilwoman, and then there was the lead Mandy had a much closer relationship and spent more of the movie kind of running around together. Mm -hmm. And they were basically Nancy Loomis and Janet Lee's characters from The Fog. There are entire scenes from The Fog that he recycled from the script. Oh. So even as I was reading it, I was picturing Nancy Loomis and Janet Lee. Well, I mean, you could do worse. God, see this movie in the 70s during Nancy Loomis would instantly make it so much more interesting. <laughs> I just found that interesting just seeing that even though it's something that he didn't really care much about and he didn't do much in, there are elements that he kind of then recycled in other things, which I've seen in other projects. Mm -hmm. At least that was interesting from a point of view. But yeah, John Carpenter fans, there's not much you're going to learn from this movie. Except even John Carpenter can write mediocre TV movies. He's not immune. I don't think anyone is immune. We're talking about the guy who co-wrote Zuma Beach. Which I still haven't seen. You're not missing much. Yeah, well, that's what I told you about Halloween too, and yet you're still insisting on watching that. I have to. I'm doing a project where I have to complete it. <laughs> <sighs> you don't need to watch it, though. It's terrible. It's not complete unless I drive in that final nail that goes crooked and breaks into my toe. Okay, fine. You do you. Any other final things you want to add, or are you pretty much done on Silent Predators? I think I'm pretty much good on not-so-Silent Predators. I still don't get why they call it Silent Predators. That makes no sense. Silent Predators would be a great title for a shark movie, because you don't hear them coming. I think that's the thing in the movie, is sometimes they're rattly, but sometimes, like, when they bust into that woman's house to, like, kill her when yeah. she's on the... Yeah, like, they're super quiet until they're not. That, again, was a scene that's not from the Carpenter script, and the mm -hmm. Carpenter script always went out of its way to have the rattle. Mm-hmm. Now, what's weird is I've seen an interview with Carpenter where he mentions that he always was proud of a scene that he wrote where when the big outbreak happens, a mom hears a rattle and goes into the baby's room where she thinks the baby's playing, but then sees the baby out in another room just as she turns around and a rattlesnake leaps out of the crib. <laughs> but that scene wasn't in the script either. So I'm not sure where John has that memory or if that's just a scene that he pitched that he didn't write or the interview that I read was like 10 years after he did the script. So he might be messing or remembering something, but that scene wasn't in the script. But it would have been a fun play on the fact that you're always hearing the rattle. Mm -hmm. I love that Max talks the one guy into, I need you to go under the house and see if there's some snakes down there. Yeah, that way. I was just like, I don't care how much I need my job. I'd be like, oh, you go fuck yourself, sir. I love that he goes and he looks around and then he has a smart idea and just throws a rock in a corner that has a bunch of stuff. And then he hears the rattling and is like, yep, they're back there. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Yep, there's snakes. Bye. I like that that happened. And again, like we mentioned the scene in the field. 
there's the scene where the teenager is like, but I want to see what that rattle is, which made a lot more sense when it was an eight-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. It plays up the fact that they are noisy and they are giving you a noise and that people are not respecting the noise. But I don't know why it's called Silent Predators. <laughs> because reasons. They're a special hybrid snake that their rattle is on a register that's higher than human hearing. That, yep. Only dogs can hear their rattle. It's because sometimes they're in stealth mode, that's why. <laughs> but yeah, not really recommend from either of us on this movie. Thank you for joining me, Evie. Thank you for having me on this really, really amazing movie. <laughs> yes, only the best. <laughs> Sorry, Alex couldn't be here for joining us on this. They're going through a big move at the time, but you'll be back for our next episode. So we'll see you then. Have a good night. Good night. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>